Many surface mount electronic components can be soldered by hand using just a soldering iron. However, there are many out there that cannot, as they have pads that are underneath the component body that you simply can't get to with a soldering iron tip. We'll specifically look at how to use a hot air station to place this quad flat no leads or QFN component. You'll see similar packages with many different names, but QFN is probably the most popular when you have leads on four sides of the component body. If only two sides have leads, that will likely be called something like small outline no leads or SON. Here are some other names you might come across and many are vendor specific. To start, you'll want to find a reflow profile for your part or solder. The linear regulator that I picked did not have a profile, so I found one for the SAC305 lead-free solder that I plan to use. Note that if you use a different type of solder, the temperatures and timing will likely be different. The idea is that we need to slowly raise the board and component temperature to around 150 degrees Celsius over the course of 1-2 to two minutes. This is known as the soak zone. From there, we want to raise the temperature of solder to its melting point over 20 to 30 seconds. This particular lead-free solder should begin to melt at around 217 degrees. The solder will fully reflow and be workable above 225 degrees, but we want to keep it below 250 degrees so that we don't damage the component or the PCB. Note that we only have about 60 seconds at that temperature range to work or we risk damaging the part or PCB. If you see blisters or bubbles start to appear in the top layer of your PCB, that's known as delamination and it means things got too hot for too long. Once we've placed the component and ensured good solder connections in that reflow zone, we want to slowly cool the component and board back down to 150 degrees over the course of about 15 to 30 seconds. This is to avoid thermally shocking anything on the board. Large gradients in temperature could cause things to crack or break. Normally, you'd set up a reflow oven profile using data like this, which would reflow all of the solder joints on your board at the same time. However, we're going to attempt to replicate this profile by hand using a hot air station. We'll set the temperature and airflow of the station to a certain amount and leave it there during the whole process. We'll do our best to heat the board and solder joints by controlling the distance between the board and the hot air nozzle. If we take a look at the QFN part here, you can see that there are outer pads and these are the ones that make the power, ground, and signal connections. These are going to be the most important, but one of the things that makes a QFN so tricky is this center pad because you cannot get a soldering iron anywhere near this to reflow the solder underneath it. It's often necessary for both a ground connection as well as heat dissipation that flows through the solder connection to the board in order to keep the chip cool. Another thing you'll often run into with these QFN parts is that the side of the pad here may not be connected to the pad underneath and it's usually more important to get the solder connected to the pad that's underneath. If there's a broken connection, then the top little copper part is just to be used as an alignment to make sure that you've lined up with the pad on the PCB. This one does look like there is a connection, which means you could potentially solder this part by hand. However, for some parts, there is not a connection between the side and the ground pad, which makes it even harder to do with a soldering iron. To start, you'll need to tin all of the pads on your PCB. I recommend applying a bunch of flux in order to do this. And then I like to start with the center pad, just in case I mess up, I can go back with some solder wick in order to remove the solder and try again. Be patient with this part as it can take some time to heat up the pad, especially if you have some vias to a larger ground plane on the underside like I do with this part. The solder on the center pad should be as even as possible and try to get it to be a thin layer. You don't want this one to bubble up and be higher than the surrounding pads because then the part is just going to rock on top of that and not be able to create a connection with the side pads. Once you're done with that part, you'll need to apply solder to the side pads. To do that, you can try to add solder to each pad individually, but for very small parts like this, I often find it easier just to create a ball of hot solder on the tip of my iron and then drag it across all of the pads. Make sure that your pads are sufficiently fluxed if you try this drag method. I highly recommend using no clean flux and no clean flux core solder for this practice 
simply because you will end up with flux underneath the QFN package, which will be nearly impossible to clean without specialized equipment. Because I don't have access to that equipment, I don't want to use any flux that requires cleaning, such as RMA or water-soluble flux. In my experience, RMA flux can be a little corrosive to boards over time, which means it's probably fine for prototypes if you leave flux on the board, but I wouldn't leave it on the board for products. Water-soluble flux, from what I have seen, can conduct small amounts of electricity, which might really mess up some analog components. So I'd be very careful about using it, even if it's a little easier to clean than RMA. Because of all this, I'm using lead-free, no-clean solder, and no clean flux. And if you come across any bridges, you can simply swipe or drag your hot iron across them just to break them. Once again, make sure you reapply flux. If you mess up, like I mentioned earlier, you can use solder wick to remove the solder from any of the pads and try again. When you're done, you should have a nice even layer of solder across all of the pads, including the center pad, and you're ready to start with the hot air portion. If you have access to a thermocouple, it can be very helpful. Note that the tip of the thermocouple, this little bead here, is actually meant to be soldered inside of a solder joint so you can get a very good read on the temperature of that joint as it goes through the reflow process. As you can see, this is going to be very difficult. The actual bead of this thermocouple is a lot bigger than my little pads here for this QFM. The best I'm going to be able to do is tape the thermocouple down in the near vicinity of the part. This will at least give me a decent reading of the ambient temperature around the part during the soak phase, but I will probably have to do the reflow portion and part placement by eye and guess on the temperature. That's gonna be a little tricky, but we're making prototypes here, not trying to do something exact. I'll turn on my hot air station and let it warm up. I like to set the temperature to 300 degrees C, which should make the air coming out of the nozzle hot enough and give us enough time to work with the part so that it can be placed properly. I also set the air to about 50%. You'll notice that this particular station goes between about 25 and 100, and somewhere between 50 and 60 on the reading works well enough for me. The faster the air moves out, the faster you'll heat up parts, which is good, but you also run the risk of blowing parts off the board. I find that 50 is about right for preventing my QFN part from being blown off the board while still heating everything up appropriately. This will take some experimentation. Now that we have all the pads tinned and we've added our thermocouple, I'm going to apply some flux over everything. Then I'm going to put the part right on top. It's going to be floating a little bit. Make sure you line up the pin 1 marker on the part with the pin 1 marker on your footprint you'll want to make sure that the pads on the part line up with the pads on the footprint. You can do this by using something like a microscope or a loop, getting down next to the part and making sure that everything lines up. I recommend not relying on the silk screen for this, as it can be misleading sometimes. Then I'm going to hold the nozzle of my hot air gun a couple of inches above the board and just slowly circle around the board letting the board soak, and this is known as the soak zone. We want to get the board, the entire board temperature, up to about 150 degrees Celsius over the course of about one to two minutes. We do this so that the flux activates, which helps to remove oxides from our surfaces that we want to solder. You don't want to heat things too fast as it can cause a thermal shock in your components or board, and if there's a large gradient between a cold side and a hot side, this could lead to things breaking. Our thermocouple here can tell us about when the board reaches 150 degrees C, but remember that it's really measuring the ambient air temperature that's near the board, since it's not actually embedded in the board itself. You could also use a hot plate or one of those underside blowers that moves air up underneath your board to slowly heat things up to that soak zone temperature. This is obviously super helpful when you're working with a larger board and you need to heat everything up slowly, rather than trying to use a hot air gun for this. However, my board is small enough, it's only one inch by one inch, so I can get away with just soaking everything using the hot air coming out of the nozzle. Once you're happy with this soak zone temperature, begin to slowly move the hot air gun down towards your component, again, making small circles. If your air is moving too quickly, you will find that you will blow off components, so adjust that as necessary. 
Once again, this will probably take a lot of experimentation. At some point, your nozzle will be essentially right on top of your component and keep making those small circles. You'll want the nozzle to be about a quarter inch to half an inch away from the component. You want it to heat up appropriately to reflow the solder without blowing the part off. You can kind of tap the part down, and when you're done, slowly move your nozzle away, taking about 15 to 30 seconds. Once your board reaches 150 degrees Celsius, then you can remove the hot air completely and just let the board cool naturally after that. Remember that it's still hot, so you'll probably want to let it sit for a few minutes. When you're done, you can inspect your soldering job using a loop or a microscope if you have one. Loops are really cheap, which is why I like them. I use like a 10x zoom. And you're looking at the sides to make sure that the pads have made connection to the footprint and that there's no bridging. And what you want to do is turn the component around and view each of the sides. If you see any missed connections or the part is offset or you find some bridging, there are a few ways you can fix this. I also highly recommend using a multimeter to check for bridged connections. And you can do this just by touching probes to various pins. I would check all of the orders of pins, at least the ones that you have access to, to see if that there's a short. If you find that there are solder bridges between the pads when you look on the side or underneath the component, or maybe the component is offset a little bit, or some of the pads did not make a good connection, the first thing you may want to try is to redo the soldering process where you flux everything, reheat everything with the hot air gun following the same reflow profile, and then see if you can tap it a bit with some tweezers to get it to reseat. The other thing you can do is if you just see a couple of easy bridges is to get some flux in there and then use a nice clean soldering iron tip and then drag it along the edge just trying to reflow those joints so that the solder breaks and reforms connecting to the pads. When you're done, you can assemble the other components. I recommend working from your most complicated part like the QFN you just placed and going out. This may not always be the case, but I generally find this to be the easier strategy when trying to assemble a board by hand. Once we are fairly sure that the soldering looks good, we can connect the board and proceed with the smoke test. Here, I'm just going to give the input 5 volts and make sure nothing explodes. Then I'm going to take my multimeter and test my outputs. So the first output should be 3.3 volts. This is a simple LDO. I threw together a PCB for it so that I could test soldering QFNs just like this. It gives me three outputs with a 5 volt input. First should be 3.3 volts then it should be 2.5 volts, and then finally it should give me 1.8 volts. This is a fairly simple part and a fairly simple board, so I'm happy to see it working. If you don't have access to a reflow oven, I've found that this is a decent way to solder QFN parts. I hope it helps, and happy soldering!